into a little bit of the science of containment and show you some schematics of the airflow paths. Obviously, with legacy hot out containment, we're fully containing the hot air, ducting it to a ceiling plenum, and that is returning to the cooling units that have also been ducted to that ceiling plenum. So we're forcing this flow path through the room. I'll step back and, and answer one of the questions that's already been asked, which is what's better, uh, hot aisle containment or cold aisle containment? And studies, both theoretical CFD analysis and in the field studies have proven that hot and cold aisle containment, if done well, are equally efficient. And I emphasize that if, because it's a potentially big if. Um, cold aisle containment is much more common. I'll explain uh, that in just a moment. But hot, the, the, the downside of, um, well, I'll talk about the advantages of hot aisle containment, which is in this example, you were looking at hot aisle containment. And so if you're fully containing the hot air, then the rest of the room becomes cold. And the placement of supply tiles is not as critical. The air is free to flow around in the room and make its way to where it's needed. So the room feels cool. The air flow is managed a little easier. Any leakage in the floor of conditioned air through the raised floor, as long as it's not under a cabinet, goes into the general space for cooling. And so this, this can, hot aisle containment tends to be more efficient because it tends to be done more eff effectively. When we look at the modular version of hot aisle containment, we don't have a full uh, duct full chimney to the ceiling plenum. Uh, but the benefits can be very close to the same. The amount of air being delivered to the IT equipment is crucial in the process of optimization. That is balancing the amount of conditioned air flowing through all the cooling units as closely as possible to the amount of air flowing through the IT equipment. And when there's excess conditioned air flowing through the cooling units and, and through the room, then it doesn't matter whether you have full containment or partial containment, hot or cold aisle, there will be bypass airflow. And I'll make that clear in, in just a moment. When we look at legacy cold aisle containment, the reason that this isn't as, uh, generally isn't as efficient is that the rest of the room becomes hot we're fully containing the cold air in the cold aisle. And when you open the door to a room with cold aisle containment that's done very well, it may be 90, 100 degrees as soon as you open the door. And just a lot of people are not willing to live with that experience or work in that environment. And so while cold aisle containment is more popular because it's easier to deploy, it's often not done as well, meaning it's not fully optimized. The environment is not taken to the potential that it's capable of. And when we look at modular uh, or partial cold aisle containment, well, I mentioned that, that are, there's that gap between the baffles and the, in the top of the aisle. And this gap does not affect the uh, potential for optimizing that balance between supply and, re and uh, demand air. And I'll point that out more clearly in the uh, section that we talk about of, of bypass airflow. The benefits of modular partial containment is that it can be attached uh, by staff. It can be relocated by staff. It doesn't require third-party installation or con construction uh, activities. Here's some images that might help under help you understand the concept of bypass airflow. It's it's quite it seems like a simple concept, but it's commonly misunderstood. So in the following images, we have a simple room with one cooling unit and two rows of cabinets. And these could represent, you know, a large room with many, many cooling units and many rows of cabinets. The, the concepts, uh, the ratios of the air flows all still apply. So in this room, we have a total of 10 units of air moving through the cooling units. Uh, that's generally referred to as CFM, cubic feet per minute. So we've got, say, 10 CFM, 10 units of air moving through all the cooling units. So if you add up all the air coming out of all the openings in the raised floor, it will be a total of 10. 
In this example, we have two units of air coming out of unsealed cable openings under one row and two units of air coming out of unsealed cable openings in the other row. And then six units of air coming out of supply tiles in the cold aisles for a total of 10. When you look at the rows and the IT equipment contained in those cabinets, each row, the IT equipment requires two units of air. So there's a total of four units of conditioned air required by the IT equipment. And this is a statement you don't hear very often, that the amount of air moving through the IT equipment is completely independent of the, I, the amount of air moving through the cooling units or moving through the room. You could turn off all the cooling units and there would still be four units of air moving through all the IT equipment. You could turn on an extra dozen cooling units and there still will be four units of air moving through the IT equipment. They have their own fans and those uh, flow rates are independent. There's a few caveats to that um, when you get into the details, but that concept is generally true. So when the IT equipment is sucking up four units of air, but six are supplied to the cold aisle, then we have two units of air leaving the cold aisle as bypass airflow. So what do we need to do in this room? We need to fix, obviously, the bypass airflow coming out of the unsealed cable openings. And when we do that, we've now forced all the conditioned air to come out of openings in the cold aisle. And that's the way it should be. But we still have six units of bypass airflow because the IT equipment only requires a total of four, leaving six units of conditioned air to leave the cold aisle. And this air will leave the cold aisle, whether it has doors or a roof or baffles or not. This extra air will leave if it's just baffles and a partial containment, then that six units will leave out the top of the aisle. If it's full containment with full doors and a full roof, then that extra six units of air that's not needed by the IT equipment is going to be forced through the IT equipment. Also wasted, same amount of waste. So this though does create the opportunity to optimize. We can now reduce the total amount of air moving through the room by either reducing fan speeds. It's better to run um, 10 cooling units at half speed than it is running five cooling units at full speed. Uh, there's greater energy savings by doing, uh, by doing the 10 at half speed, by the way. So we can reduce the total amount of air moving through the room and now supply, say, five units of air into a cold aisle where four are needed. We've got one unit of extra air to uh, maintain a little positive pressure and, adjust, and accommodate for some variations in flow rates through the IT equipment. So that's the concept of bypass airflow. And, and, and it's important to recognize the difference between the amount of air, the total amount of air moving through the room and the amount of air moving through the IT equipment. That's truly how you calculate bypass airflow is take the volumetric flow rate through the room and subtract the amount of air moving through the IT equipment. And what's left over is bypass regardless of anything else in the room. So I wanna share one more concept with you, which is the four delta Ts. Most people are aware of two of the delta Ts in a computer room. On this image, they're labeled as one and three. Obviously, we all know that air warms up as it flows through IT equipment. And we know that air cools down as it flows through cooling units. There's two more delta Ts that are very important to measure and they can really provide some insight as to the potential for optimizing the conditions in the room. And that's labeled as two and four on this image. And that's the change in temperature of the air from the time it leaves the IT equipment before it returns to a cooling unit and the change in temperature of the air from the time it leaves a cooling unit before it gets to its warmest inlet temperature to IT equipment. This image shows an ideal scenario. We're not seeing much temperature change for four and two, but in this image uh, of ex typical conditions, we're seeing a lot of change. These temperatures, the colors are accurate to the, the uh, color scale on the right. Very commonly, air is supplied from cooling units around 60 degrees. And yet the warmest intake to IT equipment is somewhere around 75 or 80. So why did the air warm up 20 or 30 degrees from the time it left a cooling unit? 
Well, obviously some warm air mixed in from somewhere indicating a need for improved airflow management. And when the air leaves IT equipment, we all know that it often leaves IT equipment uh, at a hundred degrees or more, but the return air temperature to cooling units is very, very rarely ever near that high. So why does the air cool off from, you know, 100 down to say 70? Why is the air drop 30 degrees? Where, why is there a delta T there in that location where there really shouldn't be any delta T? And that's obviously because conditioned air, extra bypass airflow from somewhere, uh, either coming out of unsealed cable openings as indicated right there, or extra supply tiles somewhere else in the room flowing over the tops of the cabinets, extra conditioned air has mixed in and reduced those air temperatures. Uh, so measuring these other two delta T's, two and four, the goal uh, can be very, uh, provide a lot of insight into how much room there is to optimize your facility. The goal is to get those other two uncommon delta T's to around five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, moving from 30 degrees potentially down to five degrees is the goal. Below five degrees, uh, you kind of reach a point of diminishing returns. It's hard to achieve less than five degrees. Thank you.